Hey everybody, John Plotkina here with a second Renaissance Thoughtcast. I've spent months and tens of thousands of dollars to build an elaborate, sophisticated, and expensive state-of-the-art chroma key photography studio in my home office in order to increase the production value and entertainment value of the videos that I make for my YouTube channel. Okay, it's not that elaborate. All right, so as promised, I, uh, I got drunk, I drank Belgian beer, and I watched the, uh, the debate. So let's just jump right in and get started. I feel kind of awkward. This is the first time that I've ever appeared on camera as myself discussing politics, but I think this was worth it. I think that this is a special occasion. I've been waiting for this debate for a long time, and it was a lot of fun to finally get to sit down and watch it. So my first impressions of Lester Holt is the moderator. I think that in a debate... A moderator should be like an operating system. In general, they should be invisible and out of the way, but they need to work hard behind the scenes to make sure that the right questions get answered and you get the information that you're looking for. I thought that Lester Holt asked some pretty good questions of Trump uh, that Trump critics and Trump skeptics would be interested in hearing. They asked him about his, uh, they asked him about the birther situation, they asked him about his tax returns, things like that. Things that Trump critics are interested in hearing about. And yet, at the same time, they were pretty soft on Hillary. There was nothing specific about the Clinton Foundation. He didn't ask Hillary any specific questions about the, uh, the email server. Uh, they tried to trip up Trump with the birther thing. And I thought that was really disingenuous. They, they didn't ask Hillary about it, even though it's been proven that Hillary's campaign ads were, were in on that, too. And I have more to say about that later. But uh, also, in general, I thought Holt was lazy with his follow-ups. And uh, just like Matt Lauer was during the, the Commander-in-Chief Forum. So I didn't have high expectations of Holt. And he... I guess he met the low expectations that I did, ha did have. It, it was about what I was expecting from him. Uh, but I did not like at all the silenced crowd. Who agreed to that? Why do we have to tolerate that? Uh, I, I liked when the crowd... The few moments where the crowd reacted to what the candidates were saying were the better moments of the debate. And I feel like trying to contain the crowd for something like this probably was a bad idea, although maybe it would have just gotten out of hand. Maybe, maybe the crowd would have been screaming and cheering and roaring all the time if they hadn't been told that. But I would have liked to heard some more crowd reaction, mild applause here and there, some laughter. It felt empty. It felt like I was watching the debate by myself. And I didn't, I didn't like that aspect of it. I, I, I think a, a festival atmosphere would maybe have improved things a little bit, at least from my perspective. Now, I thought Hillary actually exceeded the low expectations that I had of her. She appeared to be chipper and awake and alive and in control of her end of the conversation pretty much through the whole debate. Maybe a couple slip-ups here and there, but there were no major health issues. At no point did she freak out and have a coughing fit. At no point did it look like she may have had a little mini seizure. I didn't see any, any issues where her eyes were going off in the wrong direction. And if you haven't been following things, the, those may seem over the top, but there are videos of Hillary Clinton suffering from just those kind of problems on the campaign trail over the last few months. So I think a lot of people were watching to see if there were going to be issues like that, but uh, whatever medication they had her on, she seemed to make it through okay. Uh, one problem that she does have, though, is with her general demeanor. And in that, I'm including her tone of voice and the facial expressions that she makes. And maybe this isn't fair. I think that in a perfect world, people wouldn't make decisions this way, but most people aren't political activists. Most people aren't idealists. Uh, most people make their decisions based on emotion and on a general impression. And the general impression that Hillary Clinton gives is of a high school math teacher who's really mad that you didn't do your homework. Uh, what, th this is something that I noticed back when she made the basket of deplorables comment. That really, that really sounds like a, a high school teacher who can't control her class. And that is the nickname that she came up with for the group of mischievous boys who sit in the back and make fun of her through the whole class. Not that I'd know anything about that. I've certainly never engaged in activity like that. But I don't know if people want to vote for their angry math teacher. And I think that's a problem that Hillary Clinton needs to sort out. She needs to find a way to sound stern without sounding smug and, um, and like she's looking down your, her nose at you all the time. Uh, aside from that, I thought in general her, her rhetoric, 
her point that she was making sounded very old and bland. Her her moments during the debate basically sounded like every Democrat speech made over the last 40 years, thrown into a blender and then poured out into a microphone. There weren't very many new ideas. There weren't very many new rhetorical tricks. It, it was very status quo. So it was very Hillary Clinton. Uh, I was surprised to see them trot out the rich people have to pay their fair share. How long have Democrats been running for office? And, and in this case, how long have Democrats controlled the federal government? Uh, they've, they've been running the White House. The Republican Congress is feckless to work against them. Uh, they have issued tens of thousands of new regulations. They've raised taxes. They've raised fees. Uh, and yet the rich still aren't paying their fair share. I still would love to see what the fair share is. I would love to see a number put on that. At what point have they stolen enough of your money? And the reason why they never put a number on that, the reason why there's never a concrete figure is because there's never enough. They always want more. The answer is and will always be more, 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 more. And uh, our focus group still responding to that phrase. I mean, that phrase is so old and tired. Come on, come up with something new, please. Now, she tried to refute trickle-down economics by talking about how poor her father was and how hard he worked. But there were no facts. Uh, this is a good example of the, the technique that I thought she would use, where she has a tendency to go off on a tangent and ignore the actual question. And she did that perfectly. And the reason why she had to do that is because the data is on the side of Austrian economics and free market. The free market is by far and away more efficient than the state, is by far and away more humane. And Hillary has no data. She, there, there's no way that she could ever make a logical case. And so she tried to make an emotional case and distract you. And I thought she did an incompetent job. She's usually better at it than that. Uh, she tried to make the case that her server being hacked was somehow worse than the information that was revealed by the server hack. And she also tried to blame Russia for it when Julian Assange just come out and said that, or at least he strongly hinted that the source on the leaks was actually Seth Rich. So Hillary needs to tread carefully around stuff like that. So I have been giving Hillary a hard time about not doing anything new, but there was one new thing that I've never seen in a debate before, and it was actually kind of interesting. And that was her idea where she's got a website where people are pumping out propaganda as Donald Trump is talking in real time, and she's trying to direct people to the website uh, to read her refutation of Trump's points uh, as the debate is going along, which is fascinating, just if only because it's so new. And uh, at first I thought, that's kind of an interesting idea. It's, it's like you have a backup team who's, who's helping you run your drive past the people who are watching the debate. But unfortunately, she went back to that well a few too many times. In fact, I counted three times that she called back to that and, uh, and, and tried to drive people to this goofy website that she's got going on. I would love to see the, the traffic statistics for that site, and I would love to see... I know that this information is, would, would be impossible to get and that there's no way to even know, but I would love to see a breakdown also of the political leanings of the people who visit that site. My guess is that probably nobody who was going to vote for Trump went to that website and read something that made them decide not to vote for Trump. So I think that one backfired on, on her. I think it made her look kind of silly, and I don't think we'll see that again. I, th I think that they're smart enough to know that that wasn't working. But uh, interesting new idea. So in general, to sum things up for Hillary Clinton, I feel like her side of the conversation really was only effective against people who probably were going to vote for her anyway. I don't understand how she can bring up uh, a how, I don't understand how she can say that we need to rebuild the infrastructure when Barack Obama, the president that she served under as secretary of state, ran on the same thing and apparently accomplished nothing in spite of the tremendous amount of money that he spent. I don't understand how she can complain about the 2008 collapse of the economy when the Democrats were largely responsible for the repeal of the Glass-Steagall Act and the role of the federal agencies, Fannie and Freddie, in the crisis. I don't understand how she could be for gun control when she herself says that crime has been at an all-time low since the 90s, but gun ownership has skyrocketed since that time. Uh, I don't understand how she can nag Donald Trump about the birther stuff when, quite frankly, the first birther was Barack Obama. Do you see this? what we're looking at here this is barack obama's bio from when he worked for harvard and it says that he was born in kenya so the idea that it's some kind of racist crazy out of control question to ask whether or not barack obama was born in this country is stupid they're doing it because they think that you're stupid the reason why the birther thing was a question was because of stuff like this and 
apparently, I mean, it, it seems that he was born in the United States. After a long rigmarole, he was able to produce a document. He was able to produce his birth certificate. So, okay, let's give him the benefit of the doubt. Maybe when he worked for Harvard and other places where he listed this in his bio, he was exaggerating. Uh, I mean, everybody, everybody kind of like runs with the story. And for, uh, for somebody in Barack Obama's position, it could theoretically be an advantage or at least an interesting talking point to say that he was born in a foreign country and that his political opinions come from the life experiences that he's had. Uh, I, I, but uh, I don't know. Uh, in this case, there, there's plenty of good reasons to ask this question. And what you'll notice happened is that after the birth certificate came out, Donald Trump let it go. And uh, Hillary Clinton's campaign staff was also involved in this. They put out propaganda related to Donald Trump, uh, related to Barack Obama's birth certificate. And uh, the, the, she was part of this. And this really is disingenuous. And I was dis I was even even disappointed in Lester Holt, who I had very low expectations for that, that he didn't bring any of that up. He just let that he, he brought up the birther thing to attack Donald Trump without mentioning any of Hillary's complicity in it and without mentioning any of the good reasons that people have had for questioning Barack Obama's country of birth. It was quite silly. Uh, how can Hillary Clinton say that Donald Trump, that the idea of Donald Trump having nuclear weapons is frightening when she was secretary of state? She expanded the violence in the Middle East uh, and voted for the Iraq war. Uh, I don't understand how she could say that Donald Trump isn't against the war enough, uh, wasn't against the war enough back when the debate was originally happening, because he, he was a little bit wishy-washy when the, when the discussion first started to happen, and then he solidified into being against the war as time went on. By the time the war started, he seemed to be fairly, pretty solidly against the war in the interviews that he was giving shortly before the war started and shortly afterward. And finally, she said that she wants to imp she wants to prove to our allies and other countries in the world that the word of the United States is still good. And I don't see how she could do that when she herself has been caught in so many undeniable, verifiable lies and crimes. But I think her biggest mistake actually was a little line that she threw out there that I think slipped under most people's attention. She said that top down solutions don't work in America. And I thought that that was fascinating because she essentially just disproved the entire premise of her whole ideology. Because the left's entire point, the left's entire solution the left's entire prescription to solve every social problem is that we need this oligarchy of elites at the top and they're either elected or appointed into these government positions and that they are smart enough to plan and run our lives for us and without them society will devolve into chaos and that they need to plan and control every little thing and um if top there and the thing is the data is on our side the the data shows that she's right that these top-down solutions don't work uh, the war on drugs is a miserable failure. The war on poverty is a miserable failure. The war on terror is a miserable failure. And that's because you can't solve social problems with violence. Uh, and that's all she has to offer is more and more violence, more and more of the, uh, the endless expansion of the power of the state. And uh, so finally, the last thing that she did was plug her own book and recommend that people read it in order to get details about her policy proposals. And I, that was really irresponsible. That was the equivalent of trying to convince teenagers to smoke. And I really hope that the FDA or some other activist organization is going to go after her and make sure that she's held accountable for that. Now, it wouldn't be fair if I just criticized Hillary because she actually had a couple of really good points in her debate. She called Trump out on his support for stop and frisk. And that is probably, it might be the only thing that I agree with Hillary Clinton on. Stop and frisk is a terrible idea. We don't need to give police the right to just randomly grab and and search people especially because in general that ends up being an excuse to put young especially black men in prison for non-violent mostly marijuana related crimes and so hillary when she started going down that road for a minute there i thought she was going to talk about that and it would have been really interesting because the the best thing that the democrats have done in this election and really the only thing that you could potentially use to make a case that uh, electing hillary wouldn't be a complete disaster is that uh, they have marijuana reform as a plank in their platform. Now, I don't trust them to do that because Barack Obama has proved that the Democrats generally tend to be in the pockets of insurance companies and in the pockets of pharmaceutical companies. And pharmaceutical companies are very much against uh, legalized marijuana because there are so many profitable drugs that have the potential to be wiped out by uh, the much safer 
uh, an alternative, which is marijuana use. As crazy as that sounds, if you haven't done any research into the health, the potential health benefits of marijuana, and uh, the fact that marijuana really is far less dangerous to your health and far less socially destructive than alcohol. And actually, see, the thing is, though, even this, uh, although I can, I can point to this as being one thing that I agree with Hillary Clinton on over Trump, even this, it rings hollow for me, because Barack Obama, the president under which Hillary Clinton served, is an admitted marijuana user from when he was a teenager. And the fact that he got into office and then did not do anything whatsoever to reform marijuana laws, in spite of the fact that, you know, really, if he'd been arrested as a teenager and thrown into prison because of, uh, because of marijuana use, it would have not only ended his career as a public figure, he may well have ended up never being able to hold any kind of, uh, any kind of gainful employment. That happens to many young, especially black men. And honestly... I think that every black male, well, every, every black person, and really every person, but especially every black male who is serving any kind of prison time for a nonviolent marijuana-related offense is a political a prisoner. And Barack Obama should be ashamed of himself, and Hillary Clinton should be calling him out on it, uh, or should have been trying to persuade him to behave differently. And she didn't. She has terrible judgment. She doesn't care about anything or anybody. But uh, that's the one compliment that I have about her. That was the, that was the section where I compliment what Hillary Clinton had to say. All right, so enough about Hillary. Let's talk about Donald Trump. In general, I thought he sold himself really well. He was able to present his accomplishments. He was able to present his arguments. He was pretty forceful. He was fiery. He was spicy. But I didn't. He, there were no insults getting thrown around. I didn't hear any usages of crooked Hillary. I was hoping he would call her crooked Hillary to her face at least once. There's still a couple more debates. It could still happen. But uh, in general, I thought he came off well. The, um, the one problem, the one cringy moment that I thought was there was a point where... Lester Holt asked him a question, and I didn't put in my notes what the question was, and I'm kicking myself over that now. Next time I'll do that. But uh, Lester asked a question, and Trump really wasn't answering it very well, and, and Holt kind of jumped in and tried to, uh, tried to steer Trump back on topic, and Trump responded to that by going, did you ask me a question? And I like the trick that he does where he kind of bullies the reporters around. That was one of the things that made me like him in the first place. But it only works when he's right. And in that one case, I thought that he was kind of dodging the question and it wasn't an appropriate use of that trick. Um, he did a good job selling Hillary as being a typical politician and part of the status quo. One really good line I thought was, they should have been doing this for years. And another variation on that line, you've been there for years. And to, to tie Hillary into the existing corrupt establishment and to point out how long she's been in public service and how many few problems she's actually solved. How many few how few things she's actually done is a good start. Uh, and he in, before the outside of the debate, he's done a good job of bringing up Hillary's corruption. But in this debate, he left a lot out. There was a lot to be desired. It seemed like maybe either he was holding back or he wasn't sure what he should say or maybe he didn't think of it. Maybe he was too caught up in the moment. But I would have liked to have seen. I thought there was enough fire, but not enough not enough of the fact. If if you could think about punching somebody. Uh, it, it, or any any activity like that, like swinging a golf club or whatever, it's not enough to just do the punching motion. You got to follow through. And I felt like there were moments where Trump could have followed through with more facts and he didn't do the greatest job for that. Uh, but th really, these things aren't decided based on fact. It's more decided based on emotions and impressions. So it might not hurt him that badly, but I personally was a little bit disappointed. I thought uh, another really good line, I like this one, was... Uh, when Hillary accused Donald Trump of blaming her for everything, and, and Trump responded with, well, why not? Uh, that was a good one. I like that. And I also like to, in fact, the line of the speech for Trump, I think this was his best, the, the best individual line that he had was that we could have rebuilt the entire country twice for the money that was wasted in the Middle East by uh, the, the Obama administration and the Bush administration with all this crazy Middle East nonsense that they have going on. Devastating, absolutely devastating. And the anti-war left should be ashamed of themselves. I'm probably going to put out a, a future video just on that topic, but did you, did you ever notice that? Do you remember the anti-war left with all their, their smug, self-righteous protests during the Bush administration and protesting against that war? And that was, I was too young. I was a kid at the time and I didn't really understand everything. But today I would have been in there with them for the most part. Uh, but as soon as Barack Obama got elected and got his Nobel Peace Prize, they disappeared, and Barack Obama made the violence and, and instability in the Middle East worse. And so anybody who protested Bush should have been out there protesting Obama, and they should, be, uh, they should be ashamed. They should crawl under a rock and hide, because it's really quite disgusting. 
All right, so now, unfortunately, I have to talk about Donald Trump's worst moment. It started with the stop and frisk, and I knew that he was for that already. I knew that it was something that I disagreed with him on, and I'd, I hope that that was one of the last big ones. The other big one is the Edward Snowden thing, which didn't come up w during the debate, but we'll have to talk about that some other time. Uh, but after the stop and frisk stuff, which was bad enough, he then went on to agree with Hillary Clinton and and uh, and advance this idea that you shouldn't be allowed to buy a gun if you're on a no fly list. And boy, did I that that made me mad. I was not happy. Uh, see, the thing is, Trump Trump is not an ideological guy. I think that he he gets these things on an instinctual level and not really on a philosophical level. Uh, I don't know. I, I would be surprised if, if Donald Trump ever sat down and actually read a book of philosophy. I don't necessarily mean that as an insult. Philosophy isn't everybody's thing. And this is a great example of why that's a pitfall. If you're going to be involved in trying to solve social problems, which, which in a way, if you accept the premise of social democracy, which I don't, but uh, if you do, then the, the whole purpose of politics is to solve social problems like this. And you need a grounding in philosophy before you even attempt something like that. And uh, this is a good example of how you can get into trouble if you don't have one, because the no fly list thing is creepy and Orwellian and terrifying. I don't want to live in a country where the government can put me on a list with no due process and then take my civil rights away. And I, I made a video a while back called uh, Tom Arnold's Emotions versus the Second Amendment. I'll put a link in the description of the video if you want to check that out. But in that, I talked about that. Uh, more in depth. And I guess maybe I don't need to make a new video about it. You can just watch that one. But uh, that needs, that is something, there's something important that you have to understand. And that is that electing Donald Trump would be a, a key victory in, in this battle, in this war, but it, it wouldn't be the end of the war. Uh, part of it is that we have to keep fighting against the corruption. We have to hold Trump's feet to the fire. We have to make sure that at least some of the corrupt people who can be verified, they need to be tried and they need to be sentenced and maybe even serve some prison time. This idea that corrupt politicians who've committed crimes, uh, they either get away with things completely or they get pardoned by the next incoming president. And that needs to end. And I, I think there's a chance that Trump might end that. He, he might not. He might go with the, the, like what happened with Nixon, where it would be, the, the thought is that it would be too embarrassing for the country, too damaging for the country to have the president serve uh, some time in prison. And I think that is 100% exactly wrong. I think it would be the ultimate fulfillment of the American experiment and the Constitution if, if a corrupt president or a corrupt presidential candidate, somebody with that much clout and that much political power, if they were sent to prison, that would validate the American experiment to a great extent. And But, but we don't have that. We instead have this awful situation where people with enough political power can skirt the law while average schmoes, average schmucks uh, are left to suffer the consequences and face prison. And uh, that is a violation of the fundamental quality, uh, equality before the law that we should all expect from the Constitution. So be ready, because if Trump gets elected, there's a lot of good things that might happen. But uh, it's only the beginning of the fight, and there's some things we're going to have to fight Donald Trump on, and this might be one of them. If He, act he might just be throwing shade... It might have just been something that he agreed to in the moment. He may forget about it, or he may have just said it for the debate. If he starts implementing that, we have to make sure that we fight him. We can't let him get away with stuff just because he's Donald Trump and just because we voted for him. All right, so that's pretty much all I got. I hope that you like this. I hope that you like the idea of me appearing on camera instead of you just hearing my voice. Um, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. Uh, like, subscribe, pass this video along to a friend if you're interested in this kind of thing. And uh, thank you again to all the new subscribers. Just over the last week, I've gotten almost 200 new subscribers, and that's awesome. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it once again. And uh, it's a harsh world out there, my friends. Keep thinking.